Hey, I'm Ron Drodos from KeyboardImprov.com and welcome to our journey through the real book number 203. And this whole series of jazz piano lessons is designed to get us learning jazz standards like Kello by J.J. Johnson this week. Uh, learning them in a way that's uh, kind of holistic or takes the culture they were produced into account as best we can years later. Get understanding where they're coming from, their historical context, some different ways to play them. And today, checking the arrangement and in the real book and seeing how it's a little different than the one on the recording and uh, discovering what that is. So, uh, first of all, I wanted to mention um, a few people occasionally will comment that uh, it's, it's nice. They'll say that I give a, a vibe that's sort of like Bob Ross, that painter, you know. Someone will call me Bob Ross of the piano or something. It's a very big compliment, thank you. Bob Ross is a very special um, uh, TV personality. And um, we do have something in common. We both spend a lot of time in Alaska. I teach at the Fairbanks Summer Arts Festival every uh, July. I've been there a few winters teaching, uh, about 25 times so far. Uh, so it was spent about a year total in Alaska, a little more. Um, Bob Ross was in the Air Force, at Eielson Air Force Base, outside Fairbanks. I, I go to Fairbanks. I've actually been to the, the uh, outskirts of that um, Air Force Base, which is way out past the mountains off this highway. Um, I drove out there one time and stopped at the base just to uh, look in a little bit. Um, so um, uh, thank you. I, I could do a, a nice tribute to him sometime. I was thinking, you know, like, okay, we'll play a happy little chord. <laughs> like he used to paint the happy little trees and whatever. Anyway, I digress. Um, so, Kello, uh, it says 1957 here, but when we really do um, our detective work, that might have been when it was copyrighted, maybe if it's correct, but it was recorded in April of 1953, so it was obviously composed before 1957. And Kello is one of these pieces that uh, I kind of think, you know how some people say that, oh, I was in the right place at the right time or something. Well, some tunes are in the right place at the right time. I think the reason why it's in the real book and, and people uh, still play it or listen to it is because it was on a Miles Davis record right when Miles started making recordings as a leader himself or a couple of years after, in his early period as a leader. So Miles Davis was in, uh, in the trumpet player in Charlie Parker's first great bebop quintet starting in 1946, maybe 45. And then after a, a five years, whatever, he, he, um, he left, four or five years. He left to go out on his own, uh, worked through some personal difficulties, and um, emerged as a leader in his own right. Now, that was about 1949, 1950, 51, somewhere in there. He, uh, it took him a few years to attain mastery. This is the period where he wasn't Parker's apprentice anymore, sort of scuffling through bebop tunes. He could play. But it's not what he attained, you know, and that's fine. It took him about 10 years to get there. It's inspiring for us. He wasn't an overnight whiz kid genius, like a Parker who emerged at like age 19 or 20. Unbelievable, right? It took Miles a little longer to get there. Persistence for you and me, that's the lesson. So um, he, at this point, he's, you could hear, he'll play a great phrase, and then the next one's little run on, da 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 and then another inspired phrase, and then the next one, you know. But at the same time, there's a real charm to this period. It's not, it, he hadn't really, he hadn't formed his 1950s great quintet with Coltrane yet. That's a few years later, and that's when he really became, I think, masterful. But this period has a charm. His, his uh, open tone on the trumpet is, uh, is just crystal clear. Uh, mostly vibrato-less, and, and it has a real charm of his personality that, that he didn't always show, musically or, I guess, personally later on. Um, there was this cool sort of acerbic um, kind of uh, character, at least publicly. And, um, but the, the charm, the playfulness, definitely comes out in those early recordings by Miles Davis, early 50s. This was on an album called Miles Davis Volume 2 on Blue Note Records. And... Um, it's uh, by J.J. Johnson, the trombonist who was on the recording. Also Art Blakey, I think, um, Jackie McLean on saxophone. And the pianist is Gil Coggins, who I'd never heard of other than the, this recording. I had this when I was in high school, and I vaguely remembered his name on the, on the record. Um, Gil Coggins, I looked him up. He, he got out of the music business a few years after this um, to sell real estate. Made it one, one album later, or one or two albums later on, but basically didn't perform professionally after a while. Sold real estate. Times haven't changed, right? You have to make a living. 
It's hard to do that as a jazz musician. So um, uh, let's look at this a little bit. I'll tell you how, to, how uh, it differs from the real book. The real book versions, um, it's great. Uh, the intro is basically the same. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the head, the melody and the chords are good. Um, at the end, it's interesting because this is sort of second generation bebop, early 50s. The first generation I'm saying would be like the tunes written 1944, 45, 46, 47, early Dizzy Gillespie um, into uh, that first Parker Quintet, which broke up around 1949 or 50. Uh, I'm not really sure of the date. And um, after a while, the, the, the bebop, like anything else, becomes a quote style. So okay, if I want to write bebop, I sort of break up the, the rhythms, kind of write bump, People know how it goes, and you get a lot of great tunes and some nice tunes. I don't know if this would be one that would be considered a standard if it wasn't on a Miles Davis record. J.J. Johnson wrote lots of great tunes. He also got into um, TV and movie writing eventually, uh, composing, and he was uh, very into classical music. So this tune takes the elements of bebop, writes an intro that has these drum breaks in it. So it's like... That's more of the, quote, post-bop or hard-bop style that's leading into Art Blakey on drums, form the Jazz Messengers, which embrace this kind of um, uh, semi-arranged style. Or I guess the heads were arranged. They didn't really arrange not like a big band arrangement where you're doing backgrounds behind all the solos and everything, but the, the melodies were arranged and framed with intros, sometimes interludes, and then endings. And Art Blakey, uh, you can hear it, was in the air at this time with J.J. Johnson and others. J.J. Johnson also loved, as I said, classical music, including Stravinsky. And in an interview, he said he was actually a Stravinsky oholic. <laughs> he liked Stravinsky so much. And some of these chords at the end are very Stravinsky, Stravinsky-ish. Fourths, also leading towards fourths, which became more popular late 50s, 60s. So you hear this stuff's all in the air, even in 1953. Chordal harmonies. Uh, it's got a rare, uh, it's after the intro, it's A, B, A. And the last, the C section, the last section is uh, 12 measures long, which is unusual. Now, these chords that, that, I just, that I just played, they weren't really chords that people were improvising over back in 1953. And they made it simpler when they improvised. When they improvised, they played the A section here, as written. Um, instead of A7, uh, I noticed that you could play the uh, E-flat 7, the tritone substitution. That's um, right here, at the end of the page, that A7. And then the bridge is the same, but the last section, the C section, they truncated it. They made it eight bars, which is kind of easier to improvise over and keep track of. So uh, here are the chords. The first four measures are the same, or can kind of be simplified to... Uh, this is letter C. F minor 7, B flat minor 7 for a measure. You can write these down in your book like I did in pencil, not pen. Um, G minor 7, flat 5 for a measure. C7 for a measure. Now after that, the, uh, it's F minor, F7 for two beats as it's written. B flat minor 7. You could do either A or E flat 7 and then resolve to the A flat major 7 as they did, but keep that for a whole measure. Don't go to G7. So A flat for a whole measure, 7th measure of C, and then just do a turnaround in the 8th measure back to F minor, 2-5. G minor 7, flat 5, C7. So again, it's F minor, this letter C. F minor, B flat minor, 7. G minor 7, flat 5, C7, now two beats each, F minor 7, F7, B flat minor 7, E flat 7, A flat major 7 for a whole measure, and then a turnaround, G minor 7 flat 5, C7, takes us back to uh, letter A. So the solos are over an A, B, A form, not the usual A, A, B, A. So you can think J.J. Johnson's thinking out of the box in terms of the jazz solo form, uh, a song form. He's thinking more like a classical composer where you could extend things. Mingus, other people did the same thing. Um, after the um, uh, solos, when you get to letter A to play it again, um, 
you, well, let's see if it's the same as, yeah, actually, you can, you can play the whole thing, and then uh, A, B, C, and when you get to C, or if you're on A, where, wherever you want to end it, when you get to that A flat major 7, you go back to the intro instead. Instead of playing A flat, you play the E, so it's... play the intro, you hold the G7 when you get there, measure, I don't know what it is, and then it's a lick. A, uh, let's see, C, major 7, sharp 5. You'll hear it when I play it, I'll, I'll do an overhead shot, but, and that's the ending. You end in a nebulous way on the dominant chord, the C7, sharp 5. So. I'll put it all together, but uh, it's interesting. Listen to it again, compare with mine, do some work yourself so you really understand it. Uh, sometimes if we just sort of read a sheet, like if I put it on a PDF, it, it doesn't mean much, right? Take the time to listen to what I did a couple times. It'll sink in a little more. I'm intentionally giving you the info, but not spoon feeding it. We need to make a little effort ourselves to really assimilate it. That's a very important point. Um, so the intro is interesting because it has these built-in drum breaks. Now, solo piano, what do you do? I was thinking a few options, and, and I'm not totally satisfied with any of them, so if you have any ideas, put them in the comments, please. We could, we could actually play little drums. someone like Chick Corea having fun doing that, right? He'd maybe even go inside the piano and strum on the, the strings. Uh, we could also uh, treat it just like uh, the left hand plays the chords and the right hand solos over it. Um, I was thinking of that. Um, the, the solution I came up with is just to sort of come up with some textures, like fun rhythms, like... If you have any ideas, like I said, leave it in the intro. So I'm in the, uh, the the comments. So there we go. Good overview of Kello. Uh, it's sort of a detective work, putting it together. And um, here we go.
those endings that are kind of nebulous. It's like, is it over or not? And you can just sort of play texturally on them and see where it goes. So uh, th those are some ideas for this tune, which is really interesting when you get into it. And it's funny, you know, at first, there's a temptation maybe not to do that extra work, right? You know, okay, do I really want to listen to the recording and transcribe it? Once you start, it becomes a lot of fun. Okay, what is Miles doing? You know, and there's a few published transcriptions of, there's one of J.J., or you can you find them on the internet, J.J. Johnson's trombone solo, Miles Davis solo on, on two takes of this, and even then, the chords weren't exactly what I heard on the recording. There's one or two differences. So really train your, you know, start training your ear, or if you've already been doing this, check out what they're doing. Are they playing an A7 or the E flat? It's really interesting. The only thing I'll, I'll also say is that, you know, this is a snapshot of a particular time in, in jazz history, the early 50s, when they were into convoluted chords, and some people still did it later on. Coltrane got really into that for a while in the late 50s with giant steps and such. But Miles Davis eventually uh, uh, unembraced this type of music and went modally. He said this became a straitjacket. Like at first, it's like exciting. How do I play through these chords? And then he thought, well, it's kind of limiting me too, because um, it's, uh, it, 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 it maybe takes more creativity to just play on one chord and have to create some interest. On the other hand, um, this can spur us to things we wouldn't normally think of. So there's these two sides to this. I think also sometimes when there's really interesting chord changes, um, there's an interest built in, even if we're just kind of going yada, 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 and not really inspired, it still sounds okay because the chord changes sound okay. So you can get away with a lot more on a bebop tune than you can modally. And I think one of the reasons, well, Miles has said this, you know, he, he said the, the modal playing made him be more melodic, but also he couldn't rely on the chord changes because it was getting a little stale with a lot of players just go through these chord changes. Um, there's two sides to the coin, right? You have these very complex set of chords in jazz, which is like this roadmap, this obstacle course. And again, it can spur us to um, greater feats of creativity if we really embrace that so-called limitation of having to go through these chords that may be pretty tricky. Um, at the same time, it's fun just to play modally. And Miles really did everything. And then in the 60s, again, he got back into complex chord changes with, with some of Wayne Shorter's tunes and such, and Herbie's tunes. So it goes back and forth. The pendulum swings back and forth between modal, complex chord uh, progressions in jazz, just like everywhere else. Thanks for being here. Next week we are on Lady Sings the Blues, number 204. Unbelievable tune by Billie Holiday and the pianist Herbie Nichols. So uh, thanks for being here. Good luck with your playing, and see you in the next video.